James chapter 5. And uh, we've been on this over the last uh, few Wednesdays. And uh, uh, the title, of course, is Poor Old Job. And uh, uh, we've been looking at this instance in the Word of God. And uh, we talked um, the, in the first installment of this uh, about how, you know, people, you know, if you play a word association game, you say, you know, uh, grass, green, hot, cold, full, empty, and then you say Job, suffering. And, and people hold Job up as this, this, this uh, trophy of suffering. And, and they you know, talk about how the book of Job uh, shows you the purpose for suffering. But the, the issue with that is in 42 chapters of the book of Job, it never answers that question. And uh, a lot of people, for a lot of people, it's very important to know why the calamity came into Job's life. It's, it's just so important. Uh, for a lot of people, when you go through something, there are people in your life who want to know why. Why? And they're asking the question, why? Why did that happen? Why did this happen? Well, the Bible's never real plain. Now, don't misunderstand me. I mean, I've taught for years that Job opened the door through fear, and I don't disagree with that now. I believe that he did. But here's the point. The Bible's not never, never real plain on why the calamity came into Job's life. But the Bible tells us that Job's story is intended to teach us two things. Look here in James chapter 5 and verse 11. It says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And so we said uh, the other Wednesday that this is the only instance that Job is mentioned in the New Testament. And we never interpret, obviously, the uh, New Testament in light of the Old Testament. We interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. And it tells us that there's two things that we're supposed to learn here. Is the value, number one, the value of Job's endurance. All right, the value, the, the King James uses the word patience. It's endurance. And we talked about that at length. How Job endured this, and, and he endured what he went through. Now, most scholars tell us that Job went through anywhere from 9 to 13 months of this challenge. Well, that's probably a, a year or a little more that, that, that worse than probably anybody will ever live through. But here's the point. Job endured. Job made it. Job came out of it. All right? And then it tells us that we are to remember the end of the Lord. Well, what's the end of the Lord? That He's very pitiful and of tender mercy. So we're to remember Job's endurance and the fact that God is patient, or excuse me, God is, is uh, uh, pitiful and of tender mercy. He's compassionate and merciful. Amen. And we talked about how in both instances, when Satan uh, uh, was talking to God about Job, he said, in the first instance, he said, you curse, you, you touch his, his, uh, his, uh, his stuff, you touch him, and he'll curse you to your face. Well, then he took all of his things and, and destroyed his family, and Job still would not curse God. And then he struck Job with boils, and Job lost anything else that he had, and he still wouldn't curse God. Satan, would, Satan wasn't after Job. He was at, out to get Job to curse God. Every, everything the enemy does in a person's life is designed to move them away from God. It's all an attack on the position of life. And, and people don't, don't realize that. And, and so they, they start looking at things from the wrong angle. And we said this, that Job did better without a covenant than New Test many New Testament believers do with a covenant. He, he refused to turn on God. He said things he didn't understand. He, he didn't have a concept of God like we have a concept of God. He, he knew God purely from an a outward standpoint. Job lived in that, that age of consciousness where he could only know God by what somebody else had said or what he saw in nature. And so when all this calamity befell him, he knew that God had been the one that blessed him. So if God was the one that blessed him to Job, now God's just taken it away. And if he gave it, he could take it away. 
Well, we know that was wrong. The enemy took it away. But he didn't know anything about the devil. All she knew was what he knew about God. He said, I am saying what I have seen and what I've heard. But through all of that, the Bible says he didn't charge God foolishly and he didn't sin with his mouth. Hallelujah. That's why all through the Bible, in at least three different instances, Job is talked about as a righteous man. God called him righteous. Oh, hallelujah. So the Bible tells us that Job's story is intended to teach us those two things. That the endurance of Job and that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, Job's three friends tried to convince him that this calamity came on him because there was sin in his life. You've done something wrong. We'll look at some of that in a moment. You, you know, you, you, you've done something wrong. You know, it's, it's you, Job. It's you, you, you sinned. You did something that, that made God angry or whatever the case may be. Even today, when a Christian goes through adversity, there are other Christians who are just like Job's three friends. And they automatically assume there's sin in that person's life. Or they missed it somewhere. Or they this. Well, now, I want to say something. That's a possibility, but that's a truth. It's not the truth. You never take a truth and make it the truth. In other words, if you're living in blatant sin, yes, a door is open for bad things to happen to you. If, if you're walking in unforgiveness or animosity or offense, yes, there's a door open that the enemy can get in through. But there are people in the sound of my voice, and I know because I'm your pastor, you've went things, through things before, and you're not living in sin, you're not in unforgiveness, you're not offended, there's a devil loose. And that's what he does. He tries to steal, kill, and destroy. He's roaming about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's probing the defenses. He's always probing the defenses of Christian people. He, he doesn't have to probe the defenses of sinners. He's got full access to them. But you and I, he's got to try to make an incursion into our life and he's got to try to bring something up, to bring a trial, to bring an adversity, to bring a challenge into our life to see what we're going to do with it. Amen. But everything he does, fear is not an absolute law. It doesn't have to win. It can, be, it, can be over, it can be overcome. Everything the enemy brings against your life can be overcome. It's not an absolute law. Hallelujah. Do you see that? Storms don't necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong. Storms don't mean that you're in the will of God or out of the will of God. But you'll hear people say, yeah, just, you know, just get in the middle of the will of God. And boy, the devil's going to come. The devil's going to come, period. Regardless, he's coming. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I heard a man say something one time, and he said, to be a successful Christian, you've got to believe in a real devil. And you know, th there, there are people that I know, they don't like a statement like that. But, but the reality is, if you don't believe in a real devil... You don't know what to stand against. Job didn't know what to stand against. He didn't have any concept of the enemy. He had no concept that the devil was doing this. Am I making sense? And so, so the, enemy, the enemy will bring things up. It's my job to stand against it. Oh, hallelujah. Do you see that? I knew a minister one time. that Every time things would, he would hit a rough, a rough patch. And he'd say, it must be out of the will of God. And he'd drop what he was doing and go somewhere else. And well, yeah, things would get better for a little while because, because the enemy would let the pressure up. But he, I watched his life and over and over and over and over and over again, the enemy stopped him. Over and over and over again. That's why the Bible says when you're in a challenge, stand therefore, stand Stand, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit. Stand there behind the shield of faith. Amen. Why? Because there's nothing the enemy can bring your way that the shield of faith and the armor you've been given cannot stop it. 
You're not supposed to pick up and go when the storm comes. You, you're not supposed to just ride out the storm. According to the Word of God, you're supposed to still the storm with the words of your mouth. This is what the Word says. This is what I believe. This is what I have in my life. Oh, hallelujah. Do, do you see that? For instance, Jonah went through a storm because of his disobedience. Isn't that right? Go to Nineveh. Preach your eight-word sermon. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And what did he do? No, no, no. I'm going the other way. Hallelujah. And he would have got there if the storm hadn't come. And people say, see there, see there, God sent the storm. God sent the storm because God loved Nineveh. Are you following me? And even when they threw Jonah in the sea, it says the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Do you see that? God was taking care of him the whole way. Now, I don't want a fish ride back to where I should be. But the point is, God was taking care of Jonah. But why was he in the storm? Disobedience. But the disciples went through a storm in perfect obedience. Let us go to the other side. Jesus is in their boat. You think they're in the will of God? They are, right? But yet they went through a storm. Why'd they go through a storm? Who brought the storm? The devil brought the storm. Why? Because of where they were going. They ended up on the Isle of the Gadarenes and the madman of Gadara got set free and delivered, went back to his city and began to preach the gospel and had a revival in that city. And the next time Jesus came to Gadara, the whole town turned out to hear him. They didn't want him there at first, but when he came back the second time, that man had went back and told what great things the Lord had done for them, for him. But my point is, Jonah was in disobedience and went through a storm. The disciples were in perfect obedience and went through a storm. What about Paul? He went through a storm because of somebody else's disobedience. Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt, not only to the lading of the ship, but to ourselves also. Amen. And it said, what did it say? It said the centurion listened to the owner and the captain more than he listened to Paul, and they left. And, and no, just a couple days later, they, they got in the middle of that typhoon. Eurachlodon. They got in the middle of that typhoon, in the middle, in, in, in the middle of that storm. And what Paul said, you should have listened to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. And not loosed. But he said, I'm telling you, the Lord's given us, the Lord's given me everybody on this ship. Because I believe God, the angel of God stood by me this night and said there would not be the loss of any man's life on this boat. But how many know they could have missed all of that? They could have missed the shipwreck. They could have missed riding the boards to the sea, they, to the shore. They could have missed all that had they listened to Paul. But they didn't. Paul was the innocent party. He went through a storm because of somebody else's disobedience. Amen. Hallelujah. People are always looking for a reason. John chapter 9. The blind man sitting there. And they walk by him and what did the disciples say? Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither. Amen. Neither. But that the works of God might be done in him. And, and, and in the Greek, that's, that's not talking that God made him blind. It's talking, it's talking the power that's going to set him free. But the point is, notice what they're looking for. A reason. Was it sin? Why was this man born blind? Amen. There are things that happen in life. Somebody asked me one time. They said, now, now don't misunderstand. I'm going to hit this from both angles. There, there was a person one time that was just having a challenge. And they said, I just don't understand this. What's going on? I said, it's called life. Things just happen. Amen. Now that's not doubt. That's not negativity. If you live long enough, you're going to have a flat tire. And you can't get out and blame the devil. Like the guy I was, I was roofing with one time. This is many years ago. And I was roofing in the middle of Kansas City in the middle of summer. Trust me, don't ever do that. <laughs> it was about 105 degrees. And we had worked on this house. 
And it was an old house. You know, old house, you used to, they used to have the big porches, you know, that wrapped around. And so if, if you roofed, you uh, uh, tore the shingles off, put shingles on the top, then you had to come down to the porch. And so we had a ladder that was, that was strapped to the gutter, and we had it all secure. And, uh, uh, well, when we got done, we had to move the ladder and move all the stuff. Well, he forgot something. This is the owner of the business. And he forgot something. And so he just propped the ladder back up there, ran up the ladder, grabbed what he needed, and came back. And when he swung his leg around that ladder, the bottom of the ladder went this way, and he come down. Whop! Broke two ribs. You know what he got up doing? Stupid devil. Dumb devil. And I'm sitting there thinking, mm-mm. Dumb you. Because we had that ladder strapped the whole week that we're working on the top. What makes you think you can just run up it now? It wasn't the devil. And no, God wasn't trying to teach him something. Right? It was just a mistake. It was an error on his part. Now, right on the other hand, there are things that don't seem right. And if it doesn't seem right to you, it's not right. There are things that you'll just know. I was, I was Monday night. We were getting ready for bed. And uh, we, I spoke with some people, and, and there were some other things going on. And I looked at my wife, and I said, Sweetheart, this that's going on, this is, not, this is spiritual. This is not natural. We need to take authority over this. And we took authority over it, and we silenced it. There, there, there are about three different instances that were going on. And we took authority over it, and we, we told it to stop and cease in its maneuvers against the people. Amen. And I got phone calls from all of them, from two of them, the very next day. And everything had changed. Everything had changed. Because it was spiritual. It wasn't natural. Now you can come at a spiritual thing from a natural standpoint and make no headway. And you can, you can, come, you can be over spiritual about a natural thing and make no headway. You can bind the devil and curse the devil and quote your prosperity scriptures, and, but if you're not going to budget your money, you're not going to have any. And you can blame the devil, and you can say, he's not going to rob from me. You, devil, give, bring back all my money. Number one, he's not going to bring back your money if he took it. And number two, if you're not doing the natural things, the spiritual precepts and the spiritual concepts won't work. Because there's something I have to do. You have power over sin, but you've got to live like you have power over sin. You've got to shun the very appearance of evil. You've got to live a holy life. Am I helping you? And so these, there are things that happen in life. They're, they're not some sovereign act of God, and they're not necessarily an act of the devil. They're just natural circumstances. Amen. Now, let's go over to Job 3. Oh, hallelujah. Job chapter 3 and verse 25. Notice what Job said. Uh, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. The Hebrew says, I feared a fear, and it came upon me. One translation says, I feared a fear, and it overtook me. Hallelujah. So it appears here that fear is the reason that the hedge was lowered. I've heard people say, well, well, God lowered the hedge. If God lowered the hedge on Job, God will lower the hedge on you because God doesn't change. God's not working with the devil. Amen. Hallelujah. My pastor said one time, the devil is not God's unwitting stooge. <laughs> and he's not. The devil and God are not working together. They are polar opposites. One is love and one is hate. One is life and one is death. Amen. But he said, I fear to fear. Now remember what he said. I'm not going to take the time. It says that, that every, every time after a birthday party, one of his kids had a birthday party, that, they, that, that Job would go and he would sacrifice and offer a burnt offering and he would say, maybe my sons have sinned and angered God, and so I need to do this. And it says Job did that continually. Well, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, you know the scripture, the power of life and death is in the tongue. 
All right? In the hand. It means, it means the hand, the open one. It, and it means the direction. The direction of death or life is in your tongue. You're directing your circumstance towards death or towards life through your tongue. Well, that's always been the case. That's a law. And if Job was constantly saying, I better do this because my sons may have sinned, my sons may have cursed God, he's opening a door to fear. Hallelujah. Now there were some reasons that Job may have had for being in fear. But the point is, we talked about how, you know, Job, according to Scripture, according to what we read, was not an Israelite. He was from the land of Uz. He was from the land which was in Edom. And it doesn't appear that he was under the same covenant that Abraham was under. He was a contemporary with Abraham. But uh, so we could say he had no covenant with God in, in, that, in that sense. There is the indication that his children were not very godly <laughs> because he was sacrificing for them. And, you know, Job's wife wasn't very high on the spiritual pole either. <laughs> Why don't you just curse God and die? Amen. But fear is not an absolute law. There are some things that can happen when we fear, but it's not an absolute law. Law. Notice in uh, Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. And verse 14. He says, In righteousness you shall be established. You will be far from oppression. Why? For you shall not fear. And from terror, for it will not come near you. Fear will always open the door to oppression. Always. Fear opens the door to oppression. It opens the door to torment. That's what the Bible in, in 1 John says. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And so fear always opens the door to oppression. It opens the door to torment. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 7, Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Notice what Paul says. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fright, fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now notice, Paul says, fear came. Fear tried to show up. That with, without were fightings. There, there were challenges going on. And fear tried to rise up. Amen. Fear, fear will come. Fear will try to show up. But remember, it's not an absolute law. It doesn't have to win. I don't have to fear. Yeah, but I, I feel like I'm afraid. That, 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 that doesn't mean anything. What you feel is irrelevant to what you say. Does that make sense? Well, well fear is trying to come, come up in me. That, that's irrelevant because it'll, it'll obey what you say, what you feel. That, that's why David, under the old covenant, he said, I will not fear what man can do to me. Right? He said, I will lay me down and I will sleep and I will awaken because the Lord will sustain me. He said, though ten thousands gather round about, I will not be afraid. And that was a man under the old covenant without the indwelling of the Spirit, but he had a revelation of God's keeping goodness and he said, I don't care what's going on, I won't fear. I won't be afraid. Amen. Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. I will not fear evil. Amen. Now that's important because just because fear presents itself, it doesn't disqualify you. The, 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 the enemy will try to get you to think that, you know, uh, 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 that, that feeling... 
That challenge that you face, that, that means you did something wrong. That means you're not whatever. You don't qualify. You're not a strong Christian. You're not whatever. Just because fear presents itself, it doesn't disqualify you. Remember Brother Hagin telling the story? He said I, those alarming heart symptoms came on him. And he said, I got up out of the bed and I was, and I was walking the floor and I was quoting the Word and praying in the Holy Ghost. And he said, the devil said, you're not going to get your healing this time. Right? And, 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 and told him, you're afraid. You're afraid. And he said, I'm not afraid. And the devil said, yes, you are. Look at your hands. They're shaking. And he said, I looked down. Sure enough, my hands were shaking. And he said, I told the devil, oh, devil, that don't mean anything. I'm not a body. I'm a spirit. And my body might be shaking, but inside I'm solid as a rock. My spirit is strong, trusting in God. See, this is the carrying case of you. Fear might try to come up on this flesh body, on your soul and on your will and on your emotions, but your spirit is not afraid. And when you let your spirit gain the ascendancy, fear must take its leave of your life. It will pack up its bags and leave you when you let your spirit gain the ascendancy. Because your spirit is not afraid. Hallelujah. So just because fear presents itself doesn't disqualify you. Just because you go through a challenge, it doesn't disqualify you. I've had, I've had Christian parents come to me before and say, you know, Pastor, I, I, I feel guilty. And I would say, why? And they'd say, well, my, you know, my kids aren't living for the Lord. And I'd say, okay. And they'd say, I raised them right. I said, okay. That's what you were supposed to do. You did your job. You trained them up in the way that they should go. And the Bible says that when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Amen. Isn't that what the Bible says? So you did your part. You can't be ashamed because somebody made a decision to do something that's not right. See, the reason I'm saying this, that opens a door for the enemy. Job opened the door for the enemy to get into his life and according to what I see in Scripture, through the avenue of fear. Hallelujah. Now, back in Job chapter 2. Hallelujah. Job chapter 2 verse 11. It says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come on him, they came, every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhi, Zophar, Zophar the Namathite, for they may, had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and did not know him, they lifted up their voice and, read, uh, and wept and rent everyone his mantle, sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with them on the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spoke a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Now, Job's, or Satan's plan was not to kill Job, and we know this, it was to get him to curse God. Job's friends, their original intention was good. They came to mourn with him. You know, the Bible tells us to weep with those that weep. The Holy Spirit desires to comfort people who have went through things in their life, went through tragedy, help them in the midst of their sorrow. That's very important. Amen. Because, because you know, uh, we got to be careful with that. I was, I, was, I was talking with somebody the other day and a relative of theirs had passed away. Well, their mom had passed away and it was, it was a challenging situation. Uh, uh, they had they had went to check on their mother and she had passed away and so it very challenging and I was I was talking to him and I could hear this in his voice you know when you're talking to your pastor and you're going through something and and I say this and understand I'm not I'm not I'm not being arrogant I'm saying they're listening with their spirit not just with their ears that's why you have a pastor they can pick up on things sometimes should most of the time. And I could just pick up on something. That there was this hint of, oh man, you know, where did we miss it? And I, and I, and I, I need to be having this stiff upper lip and, and this and that. No, I'm not saying you should let grief overwhelm you. But I told him, I said, listen, you don't have to respond to this according to how you think anybody else wants you to. 
I said, the, 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 the bottom line is, we know your mother is in our future. We know she's part of the great cloud of witnesses. She went to heaven. We know that. She's born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. But here's, here's the bottom line. There's still a hole there. My mother has still went to heaven. And there's still a hole there. And I can't deny that. I don't want to let that overwhelm me. But, but see, the Bible calls us to help one another. The Bible calls us alongside of one another to aid one another and help one another get through those, those situations that we might be dealing with. Amen. They came to comfort Job and ended up condemning him. And we're going to get more into this in this series. But they came to comfort him and ended up condemning him. And he had been so affected by what had went on, notice his friends didn't even recognize him. They lifted up their eyes and saw him and didn't know him. Well, I mean, he's sitting out there struck with ulcers from head to toe. I mean, he's been scraping them with a piece of pottery. His life is in shambles. He's sitting on the ash heap of what used to be his life. All of his, all of his livestock's gone. All of his children are dead. His wife's telling him to curse God and die. And they, they lift up their eyes and see him, and they don't even know him. See, Job wasn't just having a blue Monday. He wasn't having a bad day. He was experiencing ongoing, stinging pain. His grief was really great. It was real. This is just days after his entire family is wiped out. I mean, in one day, one day, they're all in the house, and the house falls in on all of them, and all of his kids are, are, are dead in one moment of time. All of his, all of his livestock gone. Everything that he had to make, all of his money, gone. His health, gone in a matter of two days. Whew. So his grief was very great. Job chapter 3 verse 1. After this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. This is where Job broke. Now, now please don't misunderstand me. I'm not, obviously there were things Job said that was not right. But this is where... He broke. From this point on in the book of Job, we see just how deep Job's grief was. From this point forward. All right? He says, essentially, I wish I'd never been born. Cursed his day. Then in Job chapter 6, verse 8, he says, Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant me the thing that I long for even that it would please God to destroy me, that He would loose His hand and cut me off. Whew. Verse 11, What is my strength that I should hope, and what is my end that I should prolong my life? And then in chapter 7 and verse 11, Therefore I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Verse 15, he said, My soul chooses strangling and death rather than my life. Mm. When you would rather be strangled and die, you're hurting. <laughs> you're facing a challenge. That's putting it mildly. Amen. Now, I'm just showing you the depth of what he's going through. That This is how what he's experiencing. Job was under so much Pre pressure and stress that he thought it would be better to die. Mm. Now, notice in Mark 14. See, he's going through this. That's the pressure, that's the challenge that he's going through. And his friends are saying, well, you must have sinned. You must have done something to make God angry. And God tells Job, we'll get into that in the, in the future, but God tells him, look, look, you're seeking to justify yourself. You're seeking to blame me. And you're just doing that to justify you. God didn't blame Job, but he said, look, you're, you're just seeking to justify yourself. But his friends were absolutely wrong in saying, Job, there's some sin in your life. Why? Because twice, 
out of God's own mouth. He said he is a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and shuns evil. So we know out of God's own mouth. It wasn't because of sin. It wasn't, it wasn't because of, of wrongdoing. It was the devil. Now, Mark 14 and verse 34. Jesus in the garden, he said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry here and watch. If you're going through a challenge in your life, I want you to know you're not alone. You're not alone. The God that ministered to Jesus, the God that ministered to the men and women in the Bible, the God that restored hope to them, the God that brought strength to them, is the same God that wants to bring strength and life and minister to you. Jesus can relate when a person's soul has been crushed. Because he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. This is when he's praying in the garden. You remember what he prayed. He said, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. If there's a way out, if there's another way, right? And he had to pray that three times and pull his, his mind and will and emotions under the control of his spirit because there was no other way. But notice what's happening. My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. This is a real thing that Jesus dealt with. It was a real thing that he went through. Now why is this important? Because there are people that when you're going through something, they can't relate with what you're going through. And that's why somebody will come along and they'll say, Hey, 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 just come on, stiff upper lift. It'll be okay. Come on. Come on. Where's your joy? Come on, let's dance. Let's... No, that's, there's not always, that's not always the time to do that. That's, that's always right, but it's not always the time to do that. Amen. The Bible says when, sometimes when people are weeping, you need to weep with them. It says laugh and rejoice with those that rejoice, but weep with those that weep. Amen. I've seen that more than once. I would go deal with somebody and they were really going through something. And the best thing I could do is just sit down and put my arm around them and just look at them and say, you know what, it's going to get better. I, I, know, I know that this is hard. I know that this is a challenge. But I know this. I know you're going to come out of it on the other end. But until then, just let me hold you. Let's just weep together. Let's just, let's just love one another and let's get through this. Amen. I, the, the gentleman I was talking about uh, uh, just a moment ago, he called me and when I picked up the phone, he told me just what had happened. And, and, and you know, I was just silent on the other end because I don't need to say a lot right then. He called me to talk to me. He called me because he needed to tell somebody what was going on. Amen. And I told him, I'm just going to listen. I'm just going to listen to you. I'm just going to listen to what you have to say. Amen. And, as the, and, and you know, the next day, the next day, the Holy Spirit, I was up praying for him. And the Holy Spirit gave me a scripture and gave me something to say to him. It's not always, you don't always have something to say right then at that moment. But what I can do is say, you know what, it's going to get better. I know it doesn't look like it's going to get better, but the sun will come up tomorrow. We're, we're going to get through this. Amen. You, 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 you cannot take a truth and make it the truth. You know, Brother Hagin would always talk about how there were symptoms and things that came on his body because he would get in disobedience. And, I, and I'll hear people, they'll take that, that same stand. You know, God doesn't deal with everybody the same way. Now, disobedience will cost you, but understand what I mean. It affected Brother Hagin in his physical body. Disobedience affects me and my finances. Ask me how I know. Amen. Now, can disobedience affect your finances? Eventually it will. It affects mine like right now. Hallelujah. Now, God's not, God's not affecting my finances. My disobedience is affecting my finances. 
But here's my point. Some, somebody will hear somebody say that, you know, a loved one died and, you know, they didn't grieve and they didn't cry and, and you know, the Lord told them this or that or the other. Well, I understand that and I respect that. And, and again, I don't think that grief should overtake our life. But here's, here's the thing. God may not deal with you to do that. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. You, you got to understand that. Because I got to understand, my point, my job as a believer, my, my job as a brother or a sister is not to get somebody to act like nothing's happening, but to support them and encourage them and let them know we're going to get through this. It's all going to turn around. Amen. Job's friends couldn't relate. They were well-meaning but ignorant. They didn't know any better. They came to mourn with him and ended up condemning him. Job said a lot of things that were incorrect and wrong. And very often when people are hurting, they'll say things that are wrong. They'll say things that aren't exactly right. Mm. It's better not to try to correct them. Hallelujah. Minister to them. For, for instance, I, I knew a pastor one time in, in Florida. There was a young man in, in, in their church that had come to their church, and, and, uh, and uh, he rode a, a real fast motorcycle, a race bike, and he was in a wedding with his friend, his best friend. He was the best man. And uh, they had been out at his friend's house all night, and, and, uh, and he was running late, which was normal for him. And so he got up, he got up the next morning and, and, and jumped on that bike and had to run home to get ready. And, and uh, according to the accounts, he tried to go around a curve that was, that was marked for like 50 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour at maybe 85. Well, he just couldn't, couldn't lean the bike far enough to get around the curve and, and ran through the ditch and ran through a fence and killed him. Very, very sad. 18, 19 years of age. Well, the pastor over that family was just adamant that they shouldn't grieve. And was just adamant about it. And it hurt that family. It hurt that family. Well, you know, Pastor, but, but, but Jesus carried our griefs. Yes, He did. He, he carried our griefs. But He also carried your sicknesses. And there's been times that sickness has tried to come on you. And you had to believe what He had said about by His stripes you are healed. Amen. You don't let grief overwhelm you and overtake you any more than you let sickness overtake you. You understand? But it was wrong for that pastor to try to make these parents that had just lost their son not grieve. Yeah, but their thinking was wrong. Well, th of course they're not thinking right. Job's friends made the decision that it was their job to correct him. And all that did was make Job more angry and more upset. That was it. Amen. Hallelujah. Look at, look at Job 42. Job 42. I hope I'm helping you tonight. Job 42. And verse 7. You know, that's why I'm, uh, I've been writing a book for some time called The Myth of the Wilderness Experience. And, uh, and, you know, there are people that will say, well, what, what do you mean by that? Because I've heard so many people say, you know, a, a lady came to Pastor Michelle one time at a meeting and uh, Pastor Michelle talked about how God was light and there was no darkness in him. And God, God didn't lead you into darkness. That, that you know, God didn't, God didn't have times when he just uh, abandoned you to teach you a lesson and just left everything dark. And this woman came up real religiously and she said, oh, I thank God for my dark times. And I've had people say, well, you know, God will lead you into the wilderness. He led Jesus into the wilderness, yes, to be tempted of the devil because he was the last Adam and he had to go through the same temptation that Adam went through and had to overcome for you and I. He went to the wilderness so we wouldn't have to. 
Amen. And people will say, well, you know, the, the wilderness experience. Listen, you don't want the wilderness experience. Everybody in the wilderness experience died. They all died. And Paul said what we're supposed to learn from that wilderness experience that they went through is don't, don't complain, don't murmur, don't doubt, believe God. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm saying that because, you know, you'll hear people say, Oh, praise God, you know, oh, I'm going through the valley. Well, good. The valley's a good place. The Bible says in the valley your soul's restored. I don't know about you. Now, the mountain has been used as a, as a symbol of victory and overcoming. But have you ever seen crops growing on the top of a mountain? You don't see any rivers flowing on the top of a mountain. There's no fruit trees on the top of a mountain. The valley's where all the lush foliage is. The valley's where the table is spread before you in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. You see? Job 42, 7. And it was so after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you've not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job, my servant Job had. Well, what had they said? That Job had sinned? That Job had made God angry? That Job was full of pride? Job had lost all he owned. His children had died. And he's stricken with a really gross disease. And he's saying some things that are not right. Job's friends basically said all this happened because there's a sin in your life. And if you'd repent, it'd all change. I remember one time I was dealing with a, a, a gentleman that had a, a breathing issue. And a, a disease. And uh, I, I went where he was and, and he was having trouble breathing and, and uh, I sat down beside him and I, I said uh, uh, alright I said uh, you know what, what's going on and he said well I'm just trying to figure out where I've opened the door do you know trying to figure out where you've opened the door can become fear and it becomes the door where have, where have I opened the door and I, and I told him I tried to tell him I said brother the devil doesn't need a door to try to attack you. That's just what he does. You're, you're, you're looking to see if you're in doubt or unbelief or sin. And you're not sinning. I know you're not sinning because I know you. I don't believe you're, you're in unbelief. May have been in mental ascent, but not unbelief. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, the enemy will try to keep your mind on things like that to get your mind off the real issue. Get your mind off the real issue. Uh, Pastor Michelle was going to minister to the family, and the Lord told her, he said, you take this brand new Bible. She had a brand new Bible. He said, take this brand new Bible that has no, no highlighting, no underlining in it, and give it to him and tell him to go back over the verses that he knows about healing like he's never read them before. Because every time Pastor Michelle would say something, he would say, yep, I heard Brother Hagin say that back in 1971. And he'd, and he'd hold his Bible and say, yep, see, I got the note right here. 19, 1970, 1969. Well, I mean, that's great. But you know what that's akin to? Oh, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. See, and over here he's fighting the battle. I've opened the door. And in reality, the issue is, is not acting on the word like you've never heard it before. That's why the Bible says you rejoice over God's word like a man that finds a great treasure. Amen. Because the, the enemy will try to get you focused on something else that's not the problem. And, and right? Well, I'll tell you what the problem is. That, that's what you'll hear. Uh, you don't have any faith. You're not believing God. 
You know, I've, Lord, help me say this correctly. The Lord, the Lord has told me I have not built my faith in a certain area, but I've never had the Lord tell me you don't have any faith. I've, ne I've never had the Lord come and make me feel bad about what I'm going through. That's always the devil. Now, now why is that important? Because the enemy is trying to get your mind and your, your focus off of what the real issue is and get it over on something, some peripheral issue that's, that's of no consequence. Amen. Do you see that? And I've, I've got to keep my focus on what the Lord said to me. I've got to keep my focus on what God said. We have that ability. We have that, 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 that opportunity. Job didn't have four Gospels to go to or the Pauline epistles. We do. Amen. That's so important. And so when you see somebody going through something, you know, the Lord may or may not give you something to say to them. If you don't know what else to say, you just go tell them, we're going to get through this together. Brother, sister, we're going to get through this. Amen. Pray with them. Believe, pray for them. Believe God with them. Amen. It may, it may be their fault, but it's not my place to tell them it's their fault. It's my place to, to, to help them grow, to help them do what God wants them to do, to help them walk through those things. Amen. Hallelujah. And you know, thank you, Lord. You know, some, sometimes people just, uh, people go home because they just get tired. Amen. Can I share this last story with you? You know, I, I, I stand before you tonight and I say unequivocally, I, my, my dad went home to be with the Lord a couple years ago and I don't think he had to. I, I think, I, I, but I think he just got tired. I think he just got wore out from the fight. And, and you know, I, I, I look back on that. My dad just had that, that Pentecostal mentality, you know, to just, you know, if, the, if, if you run into the wall and it don't move, just back up and hit it harder, you know. And, and, and I mean, I kind of have that same mentality to an extent. But, you know, uh, uh, I was with my dad in the doctor's office. I had taken him to his cardiologist appointment, and, and then we had went to, uh, to his primary care physician. And, you know, when we were with the cardiologist, I mean, my dad had congestive heart failure. Well... You know, in reality, there are people that are living with congestive heart failure. I mean, it's not necessarily a death sentence. Now, I'm not saying it's God's will, but you, you know that. But here's, here's the thing. I'll tell you two things real quickly. Here's the thing. As I was with him at his cardiologist appointment, you know, the cardiologist was, you know, guarded. I mean, he was like, well, it's, it's not any worse. I mean, you know, it is, is what it is. Now, that's the world. And, uh, you know, but, but, but we left, and I said, no, Dad, I said, you know, the Bible says that, that the Word is, is, is your strength. You know, the joy of the Lord your strength. And I said, now, you know, you know what you need to be doing. And I said, okay, the man just said, you know, it's, 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 it's the same place it was. So, all right, let's, let's keep going. Let's, we're going to stay on your medication. We're going to stay with the Word of God. This is going to be okay. And... Uh, uh, but we got to the primary care physician. Primary care physician, good guy, nice guy, sweet guy. But uh, uh, he sat there and was talking to my dad. And, and uh, he said, now, you know, i got to be honest with you. He said, your days as a traveling minister are over. Your days of preaching and teaching are over. When he said that, I saw my dad go, that was it. You know, it was a month and a half later that he went to heaven, but he died that day. That was it. He just quit fighting. And when he called me that uh, Monday morning early, about 2 o'clock in the morning, and he said, son, he said, I've, I've talked it over with the Lord, and the Lord, now watch, the Lord said, if I want to, I can come home. And I said, well, Dad, what would you say? And he said, I told him I wanted to come home. So, see, there was a choice. But I couldn't begrudge my dad. He was wore out. He'd, he'd been fighting it. 
You, you understand what I mean? And yeah, I, I tried to encourage him. I tried to, you know, but when somebody gets wore out, they're just tired of the fight. And you get that close, you get that close where Jesus can say, come on home. It's just, it's just too overwhelming. Like the guy told Brother Copeland, his wife saw Jesus and she came back to life. And a couple months later, he brought her breakfast in bed. And she said, honey, you know I love you. And he said, yes. And she said, but I've seen Jesus. And so if you don't mind, I'm just going to go on home. And sure enough, she did. And he told Brother Copeland, he said, Copeland, I'm not the ugliest man in the world, not the best looking man in the world, but either way, if they ever see Jesus, it's over. <laughs> Amen. Now, my, my, you understand? But here's what the Lord said. And I played this clip Sunday morning uh, before I prayed for people with heart conditions. And I was, I was at a meeting in Cedar Rapids, Iowa here a few weeks ago with Pastor Nancy and tremendous move of the Holy Spirit. And she said while, while she was praying for people with heart conditions that there was a pastor that the Lord said there was an endowment for the, for the praying for people with heart conditions. And uh, she said it was me. And, of course, laid hands on me, and, and I believe that we received. But here's, here's my point. When I was walking to the car, we were just in that presence of the Holy Spirit. He said, here's what the Lord said to me. He said, now you have, you have the equipping to go make the devil pay for taking your father. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. The Bible says... In, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that God will recompense you for all the tribulation that you've went through. And that's what the Lord's been talking to us about restoration and recompense. That He's not just going to restore. He, he restored to Job, right? Gave Job back everything he had, but then it says He gave him double. He restored him and recompensed him. The little woman in the book of 2 Kings, she came back after being gone for seven years and she came back to ask the king for her house and her land and he gave her back his, her house and her land and seven years of harvest. Restoration and recompense. These last two weeks of August are a reset. The Lord's been talking to my wife and I, they're a reset. And that word reset means to reset in a different fashion or to reset the same way. In other words, every day when you make your bed, you're resetting that bed the same way you got in it that night. But there are things that when you reset them, you totally change them. And so there are going to be things that are going to be reset and it's going to continue the same way. But there are things that are going to be reset that take on a totally, totally different outlook, a total, a total change. But it's going to happen these last two weeks in August. I believe that with all of my heart. And, 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 and the Lord said we've moved into the big. We've moved into the big. He said that here on, on Wednesday night, that what the Lord was trying to tell us had changed in the six days of faith and at Brother Jerry's meeting was in the realm of finances and that we moved over into that area of the big. The Lord's been telling us to press into the million flow and that's what we're pressing into and that's what we're seeing. And it's going to come to pass. It's going to come to fruition in your finances. And I'm telling you, there's going to be things that come up and you're just going to be able to write the check. You're just going to write the check and pay it off. Amen. You say, how do you know that? Because, listen, listen. But, oh, I got, I got a hush. Be, be, because we're doing it. And I hold to this. I've held to this for almost 25 years of full-time ministry. As the head goes, so goes the body. When it starts flowing on the head of a ministry, it's going to begin to flow in your life because it flows down. The anointing is like the ointment that was on Aaron's head and ran down the beard and ran down his shoulders and down his body. It covered the whole body. Aaron was a type figure in a shadow of Christ. Christ is the, Christ is the head. We are the body and what gets on Christ flows onto us what gets onto his representatives flows onto the body amen 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 and that there have been things recently that come up and we just wrote the check and you're just going to write the check that 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 has come up in my spirit you're just going to write the check and it's not going to be a faith check you're going to write the check. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Because there, there's a lot of mouths. We, we, we started seeing this deception being uncovered in the nation and in the world. There's a lot, of, there's a lot, there's a lot more to be uncovered. But there are mouths that are going to be stopped. There are people that the Lord's been telling me their mouth has to be stopped. And we've been praying against that. We've been praying against it. And, and, and as a body, we need to be praying for boldness. We need to be praying for boldness for the ministers, for your pastors, so that utterance would be given. Amen. Because, because there are things that need to be said out of the pulpit and things that need to be said out of the churches that can radically transform what's going on in our nation. Folks, I believe this, and you do whatever you want to do with it. I believe that we're, we, we have stepped into the the beginnings of one of the greatest moves of God we've ever seen. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe the church will get the job done. You believe what you want. I believe the church will get the job done. We may have fumbled. We may have dropped the ball, if that's what you want to call it. But I believe we're back up. I believe we're in formation. And we're going to get the job done. I believe that. Amen. And that's why God wants to bring those things into your life and restore and recompense and bless you so that you can write the check because there's things that God needs to get done. Amen. Hallelujah.